What's going on, everybody? This is James Grandmaster Facts Boys, and this is another edition of the Facts Project. Today, special guest, Jeffrey L. Johnson Jr., creator of Ennead, The Rule of Nine. It's been a long time coming. We've tried and attempted to do this on many occasions. So once I am happy to have him here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I'm happy to be here, man. A couple of those missteps were on my end, but ah, man, yeah. don't blame yourself. <laughs> so um, in, in the course of maybe a year or maybe even a year and some change, a lot has happened with you. Yes, sir. So I remember when uh, when we first started chatting, you had the opportunity to give me the issue one sampler, which I think I have right here. The issue one sampler for any ad. It was like pretty. I think it was maybe around like 12 to 14 pages yeah. of the initial story about a Natsu, Queen Alaria, King Ulius. Uh, am I saying that correctly? <laughs> We can talk about that. We can talk about that. <laughs> but um, it was more so an introduction of Inatu being as a wanderer or a nomad entering this monarchy. But the thing is, he has a past in this land, and there's so much backstory that's creating this. Now, for those people that are not familiar with Ennead, let them know. So Ennead, the Rule of Nine, is a, an ongoing what I'm calling serialized graphic novel. When I wrote it down, um, I wrote it down as seven 30 page chapters with a couple of short stories here and there. So all in all, it's about 250 pages of story, mm -hmm. but um, I decided to go to Kickstarter and serialize it. So that's, that's where that, that kind of title for it comes. Um, so, so, so I'm allowed to tell stories in big chunks and that's what you alluded to there. You know, there's a lot of backstory, there's a lot of lore. Um, but basically, when you open the, the pages of issue one, you see King Julius, um, which just to plant a flag there, we'll come back and we can talk about that, where that name comes from. This is a very particular place that his name comes from. Really? Um, and so we, we jump in and we're following him and, and we see him chasing down some men and basically slaughtering them. Um, the story starts fast. So you're right then and there, you know, who is this guy? You find out shortly thereafter he's a king. Well, if he's a king, why is a king brutally basically murdering people in the first three yeah, pages? They usually play in the background. Exactly. Like what why is this king not just really in the trenches? Because this fight doesn't even look fair. So right off the bat, you kind of you get a big tease, you get a big hit of information. And so that king obviously that alludes to a kingdom. And that kingdom is what we get introduced to next via the eyes of the Natu. And I chose to introduce the kingdom through the eyes of Anatu because then you can get that very standard, um, you know, fantasy feel of farm boy gone wandering, right? Mm -hmm. But it, the only difference is Anatu's not a farm boy. Like you said, he's got his own past. Um, and although he's not known, who he is is known really everywhere in this world. And so there's another hint there. So now here's this stranger, obviously, he's literally getting off of a boat in a port city. Um, so he's obviously stepping into this place just like we are, fresh. Right. Um, but there are people cutting eyes at him, and he's and people are bumping into him at the bar and trying, you know, trying to step on his Jordans. It seems like, yeah, it seems like people know of his <laughs> kind, and they start to refer to him as a slur. Yep. Like so almost, they, they, oh, I'm not sure if it's like an ethnic slur, or if it's more so based on more religious. The, the the difference there is a religious difference. Um, and excuse my city noise if you can hear it. <laughs> um, so that it's more like a, a religious difference between a Natu's culture and the culture of Athea. And that religious difference also exists in the other direction. The, 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 the religion that Athea and Athenians follow is relatively new. It's a derivative of um, a, a larger religion. We get into this also later in the story. But Athea, just to jump back, so this kingdom that we get this viewpoint for um, uh, when we, when we follow Anatu is in and of itself a new kingdom. It's 50 years old um, and it is uh, really fighting for its own sovereignty at this moment, which kind of also gets hinted on in the next bit of those opening pages, which you had in the sampler, when we introduce uh, Queen Ilaria, who's actually in charge, the, you know, the matriarch yeah. of Athea and what is known as the Ennead. And so this is kind of the nice bow on the sampler because you get a little taste as to what the Ennead is. And the Ennead, just the, the bird's eye view is um, a collection of nine families that were chosen to rule Athea for three generations as they 
fought for their, their sovereignty. And it was a pact that was made between nine noble houses um, that was meant to last three generations because they imagined by that time they would have won their war for freedom. Um, maybe they have, maybe they haven't. You know, there's right. definitely been a lull in said war. Um, but again, if the king's riding down on folks in the opening pages, things aren't all that peaceful, right? So you get a lot in those 12 pages, and it's not just scattershot, because again, there's, in those 12 pages, there's another 240 beyond it already pen to paper with years of world building behind it. Yeah, and there's more so like self-description in there, where you're basically saying that uh, their monarchy has only lasted for like a total of 50 years. So it almost feels like King Julius, the fact that he's out there in battle, which is something you necessarily wouldn't see a king do. They've probably been tested time and time again for the reason that King Julius is out here as much as he is. It's kind of like, uh, I, I guess if you want to talk about it in street wise, you know, streetways, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a drug dealer on the block when they feel like they, they're getting disrespected or they're shorted, they feel like they got to do something because there's more to prove from that person and just the establishment of that corner than it is for somebody that's like been in the game for, for hundreds of years, family lineage, generation for generation. It's funny when you say that because when I, I think in our first or second conversation, we talked about The Wire and yeah. the storytelling of The Wire. And, you know, as you progress through, you, you start to see that you know, you're introduced to the trap. I mean, that's really what you have when you first see the wire and then you balloon out and you get the bosses, you get the cops, you get politicians. And so distribution. you really see where the, the game is being played. You think it's here. Mm -mm. The reason why folks from up top get pulled into the game and, you know, uh, don't want to run down the train of the wire because that's a, that's a long, long time. Okay. Great to show ever on TV though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I would find that hard to argue with. If Game of Thrones hadn't dropped the ball, I might have argued with you. Exactly. <laughs> but they dropped the ball. Um, so, but yeah, so definitely there's a reason why he's out here. There's a reason why he's getting his hands dirty. And, and that's really um, what ultimately, there's a scene actually in issue two um, that was the original opening for the series. Mm. And although it had a battle, it was more of a friendly back and forth. Um, and, and I made the decision ultimately to go with Julius because I wanted people to recognize um, that this world was established. You know, I'm a big fantasy guy. So the, the reference I keep coming back to is The Witcher. Um, ah, you, can okay. into, you can jump into The Witcher anywhere and not feel lost. Right. You might not know the names, you might not know where he is, but if you are following Geralt, you, you can get through anything in The Witcher. And, and and it's funny because the way it was displayed on live action, there was so many time jumps. Yep. But the thing is, generally that confuses the viewer. You didn't necessarily get lost when you watched it. And the, and, and and even people I know who are fans of fantasy but not at all familiar with The Witcher as a, just an IP, they loved it. Um, and I think some of the people who who were being picky about that show was because they recognized the time jumps and would have chosen to do things differently. But it was, that was an interesting kind of uh, conversation going on around that show. But exactly, like you can, I, I wanted a world that felt lived in. And so um, that was why I introduced it the way that I did, because from my perspective, it is, it is lived in. You know, I, can, I can't answer every question in the world because no one can do that. Um, but there's a, a very, very large section of notes <laughs> that I have for this story. And, and I get into everything, you know, from founding, found the, the founders of religions and the, you know, kind of the Adam and Eve story for each, um, you know, who, 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 who follows what religion, when did, you know, this particular language die off, when did this particular language take, you know, hold. And so, and that kind of leads us into, um, you know, what I sent you recently, you know, you, you mm -hmm. look at that original language. So I'm not a linguist, but I did the work to, uh, you know, try to embed some of that into this story that right. uh, just allows it to have this solid foundation so I can take it wherever I will. Kind of reminiscent on how George R. R. Martin created Dothraki. Exactly. You know, not so much, um, you know, not so far as what uh, Tolkien did, you know, building his story around the language, but like George R. R. Martin did by paying homage to that by kind of crafting one himself. 
Um, and so it, exactly. And I think that that um, um, if there's one thing that I hear from people, it's that they can pick up on that, which is so huge to me because again, mm -hmm. I've been in this world for a long time and um, it's, it, it's important to me that people recognize that uh, you're not just, when you open issue one, two or three, you know, you're not just picking up a, a random story. You know, you're, you're, you're jumping onto something that has a clear past and a clear future. Mm -hmm. um, and you just don't know it yet, you know? And, and so the opportunity that I've had over time with Kickstarter is to really get to know uh, my audience on a personal level and, and try to play that up based on what uh, this early version of the audience is into. Now, uh, the, the main protagonist in Anatu, when he, it, when he arrives, he's alone. Like we talked about it before, how he's a wanderer and he's pretty much nomadic in this sense. What has... I mean, I'm not sure if it's if it's cool to reveal it, but what has led to him basically uh, kind of just drenched alone in this monarchy? Like what what brought him here? And when I got to the end of issue one, he leaves again. You know, so it's like, what what is his objective mm -hmm. going forth? So, you know, to talk about and I can because what I sent you from issue three. Yeah, uh, you get a little bit of the answer. Um, and, and he, you get as much as he's willing to give you. Um, so, and this will, this will uh, lead, kind of pull from the last answer that I just gave. But let me do, when he leaves the city of Dumport, you know, and this is why the map for me was so important uh, in getting that when I introduced this world to introduce the entire, uh, the, set, the, the bulk of the map. And it's uh, dope, I, by the way. I, the, the, the young lady that put that together did an awesome job for you. Dominique, she killed it. She just gave me an, uh, so the world is is in third. She just gave me a, the next third um, that I'll be releasing later in the year and, and she killed it again. So uh, shout out to her. Um, the So I wanted that map out there because when you watch him walk out of that city, I want you to know that he, imagine for those of you who've never seen the map, imagine Florida and imagine being in the Northeast tip of Florida, exiting Florida. That's in effect where a Natu is, right? So if you think about that on the map, the rest he's, of the country is there. So he's in Jacksonville. <laughs> Basically, yes. He wanted to watch a Tebow game. Uh, not, <laughs> not Trevor Lawrence, because it's going to be Tebow's team. They messed right. up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. So he's, he's, he, that's where he is. So he's, he's left, but he's really still entering this brand new world. So that's, that's one of the really important things that you do. You, you saw him have the opportunity to, um, you know, make a name for himself in that city. Uh, he, he chose not to. He chose to walk away from that. Um, and, and that goes to where you catch him again in the beginning of issue three. And I'm actually glad that for this context that you actually have missed the middle um, because I don't mind telling you where he was at the end of issue one. I don't mind telling where he is at the beginning of issue three, but I don't want to talk about what he did in issue two. So good. Ah. Man. <laughs> um, so where he is, he actually stumbles across um, uh, pretty much a little outpost of uh, folks who do follow his religion. So like really most. That's religions. where it seemed like like he finally met someone that mm -hmm. was familiar to him mm -hmm. because they're they're out there. I mean, you know, no matter what faith it is, you can find it. You can find your little outcropping of Scientologists anywhere. You can find your. You know, Lutherans anywhere. You can find, you know, whatever faction it is, you can you can find them. And so he found he found some. Um, and and it's not uh, the reason why they are where they are. Also, is hinted at they they refer to uh, they refer to it as lagima that you read, but mm -hmm. that translates to the separation. Um, and so that just goes back hundreds of years to the way that the land masses actually formed or are believed to have formed the Habashi um, after this event known as the separation. So uh, imagine, you know, imagine Pangaea and then imagine yeah. this cataclysm known as the separation. So at that point in time, before the separation, everybody lived in this landmass together. And right. although there were cultures that were, were definitely, you know, there were barriers and there were factions and everything like that. Um, you, you didn't have to cross the ocean to get from place A to place B. Well, after right. the separation, you do. And so there are folks on either side of that divide who follow X amount of faiths. And, and see, I under, uh, what, 
what I saw about that, and for anybody that does not know what Pangea is, good God, look it up. It's basically how the Earth, uh, Earth's continents and how the shelves basically broke up and gave us the continents of, of how we see them now on Earth, how they are. So I can, I can pretty much foreshadow that they were once one people. And all, although they have broken up, there's been religious sects and how they've constructed culturally amongst themselves, amongst the nine. There's similarities to it as how they've constructed their faiths, brought upon, brought upon monarchy, how they've uh, constructed economies out of their villages. And it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, separate but equal. And, and you know, so you, you, you touched on a lot there that, you know, <clears throat> and so the short, answer, the short response is yes, that's mm -hmm. what you mean. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I love to throw out the folks is, um, you know, the, the story of the Tower of Babel. Um, yeah. So, you know, think about the Tower of Babel as, you know, in, as it relates to a giant global cataclysm. And then think about that short story that I just sent you that you said you had questions about. Yes. Now we can start to get a feel for if there's one true origin story and there isn't, but if there was one, it's by connecting some of those dots. So I like throwing that out there just because that is part of what will unfold You'll, you'll get, um, you know, almost like your clearest view of that at the end of this first arc, your clearest view so so far, um, which is after issue seven. But so to jump back to where Natsu was, because one other thing, so he hints at the, the separation. So that's one reason why he, he finds his folks on this side of the expanse, which is the, the ocean that they refer to here. Um, and um, then you have something that he refers to as his obligation. Um, and and I'm, I, I haven't com committed my language to memory completely. I remember things like the separation and I can say a few things, but I can't remember obligation right now. So rather than butchering this language, um, mm -hmm. he, he refers to it as his obligation and you'll eventually get that translation. But um, he, he, he says this and, and, and she knows what he means because there's a cultural practice on the islands of Kavana that say that men and women um, of a particular uh, birth order are, are basically drafted into their Navy. Um, mm. And you're obligated to serve for X amount of years. And at the end of that obligated service, you have a choice. Um, you either continue to serve, the, the whether it's the Navy or just the nation itself, or you leave. Right. Um, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like most European countries. And, and, and Anatu is no longer on the islands of Kabam. So that gives you a, a hint as to why he is where he is without telling you anything at all. Because why did he choose not to follow? Why did he choose not to live that life? Especially when you see a little bit in issue one and a lot of bit in issue two that he can handle himself in a fight. Um, yeah. So, you know, why, why, did he, why did he walk away? And there's a reason why he walked away. And it's a, a very personal reason that begins to get teased out. It actually is teased out in the first page of issue two. There's a dream splash sequence. And that's the first hint that you get that everything is not okay with a not from a mental perspective. Um, and that just gets teased out through the first arc. You get no definitive answers there, but you do get some more, uh, some more hints. Now, is this more so from his action in actions inside of the military, or is this more so family history? So uh, let's say the primary focus would be what you might call some PTSD. Yes. Um, and then uh, the other half, which might be a bit of family, but family not in the sense because the way that his culture views family isn't necessarily by surnames. Mm -hmm. all, they, they still embody that we are all family kind of feel. Right. You hopefully, can get in that first, the first ten pages of issue three. Everybody is family. That that's, that's kind of like how I I saw it in the beginning. It's kind of like how um, in the practice of people that are Vietnamese, there's a lot of them that have the same last name, and it's not so in in pertinence to the fact that they have their by relation same family members. It's because there was a king with that last name, and they've all basically inherited that name. And that's a great way to put it, right? There, every culture has its little ways of defining themselves and, and their group and, and then the subgroups within it. And so on the islands of Kavana, 
pretty much everybody is family. And, and so there's a particular greeting and there's a particular goodbye, which you also see. Um, and the translation there is, may we find peace, which is the name of issue three. Um, I saw and, that. And the response is uh, uh, under mother, within mother's heart, right? So mother is their deity, which also connects to why he's referred to as a pagan because he doesn't follow the divine like the folks in a theater do. So um, there's a lot that's packed in there. And, and the patient bit, another thing that we talked about in the past, and we kind of hinted at this kind of backstage before we got live is, on the one hand, I'm very proud of where I am, but on the other hand, I'm nervous at this moment in time because I'm being so patient with how I'm telling the story. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and being patient with how you tell the story when you don't have guaranteed funding for said story to be told, you make a lot of promises that have payoffs way down the line. Yeah. And so even the call and response, even this unique language where I don't necessarily translate it on the page, um, you know, I'm, I'm taking risks there because that can turn some folks off while it's intriguing. If I'm telling you this and then you got to then read the short story to get some insight into where that language is coming from and, and what culture is defined in that and mm -hmm. magic that might or might not be connected to that, you know, you got to do a lot of work. But again, as a fantasy fan, I'm used to that. You have to do the work. All, fantasy authors always drop one line on you and page three. And then that was the answer to the riddle, you know, that the whole first book was about, you know, and they do that to you. And so you know, Game of Thrones fans, R plus L equals J. I mean, like that took over the internet when we got to like season six ish of, you know, Game of Thrones, the television show. Yeah. Star Martin hinted that in the nineties in the yeah. first, book, right. In a, in a dream. Right. So, you know, he, he, here, here he has his protagonist who later gets killed in the first story, have a dream while he's recovering from a brutal leg injury that basically foreshadows the entire conflict for the rest of the story. Yep. And most people are going to throw that dream away. And so, and, and again, I think this is just something that's innate with fantasy and, and people who enjoy fantasy. Although that's a risk from a money-making and money making and marketing perspective, it's a necessity for telling a fantasy story. You can't rush that. Um, right. And you, you have to have those. If you actually want a fantasy fan to get through your story and feel satisfied at the end, there has to be some bit of that. So um, again, I'm glad that you didn't read the middle there because that would have made what we just talked about even more difficult. You know, um, I'm going to right after it, this. I'm glad you will. Um, <laughs> it, because it's, you know, Anat so Anatu is, he is where he is. He is experiencing this new kind of burgeoning monarchy because he decided to walk away from his culture, his family, broad speaking, um, for a very particular set of circumstances. And, and really cool thing just to leave it there. And maybe we can jump into some, you know, something else uh, is just because I want to avoid spoilers beyond that. Um, yeah. The last short story of the year is a 12 pager that follows what are known as a band of Raukitas, or basically like a, a SEAL team for the islands of Kavan. Okay. And so we, just like we do in the first few pages of uh, issue one in, in the main story, we jump right in and we're following the conflict. And that's what we're doing in this short. And that one's called High Value Target. And basically you have this highly skilled, highly trained, uh, group of Raukitas who are, are on a hunt and you get to see without seeing that out to without me dropping too much boring backstory you get to see what that obligation that was hinted at in issue three was all about for young men and women who grow up on the islands of Kavan. Now the way that you're crafting this uh, and I know we talked about it before in the past I think it was one of our past lives where um, George R. R. Martin when he was putting together Game of Thrones he started to concoct these little small novellas, almost in these short story sets, like a uh, Dunkin' Egg, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, basically foreshadowing their storylines with uh, pretty much how they grew up and then who they were going to become. Like you, you know exactly who they are when you read the story, but you never really like got the sense of who they were before that. And they were two, they were totally different people from the novellas. So does does the short stories? And where you're talking about with this sort of elite group that's happening out there, how do they pretty much present themselves uh, to a not to? Uh, how are they establishing themselves within the culture? Are they trying to 
bring him back into the fold? So, you know, what's interesting there is, and they're not even, so that, that story runs concurrent with the timeline that we're in. Mm. So whether or not they know or not to, I don't know. We'll right. find out. They certainly don't reference him. They certainly don't talk to him. They certainly don't even think about him in this mission. They're, they're working. So, and, and work for them is, you know, it's, they're, they're, effect, they're gonna affect mercenaries. The, the way that the island of Natu uses its military, and when I release the other third of the map and you see where they sit strategically, there's a reason why they've developed such a powerful Navy um, from you know, the separation till now, right? Because they're basically stranded, right? Had they not developed the Navy and, and just from a, uh, the, from, from a trade perspective, yeah. Um, did not develop the Navy early on after that separation, they would have, that culture would have ceased to exist because of where they are uh, just geographically. So yeah. there's a reason why over the centuries, this was the spot where I felt either this thing has to fall off the map or they have to develop a, a Navy, like the Fire Nation and, and, and uh, Last Airbender, right? Like, or the Greyjoys. Exactly. Bingo. So both of those are actually huge um, in the way that I view um, the islands of Kaban, um, in terms of just the way that I try to shape their cultures. Both of those are very hard cultures, very hardened, uh, tested cultures. So, is, so are the Kabanians. They're, they're in much in the same, cut much from the same cloth, exactly. And, and, and so I love that, you know, and, and this is what happens when fantasy fans start talking about fantasy stories, right? Because right. we're all within this, very, you know, there's a word, um, it's called it's schema. And, and I was a teacher back in the day. So, you know, and, and I now have a little baby. And so schema is basically think file folders on your desktop, right? You have schema for dogs and schema for what a computer is and schema for trees. But if you click inside that box, you have a bunch of different representations of that particular thing. Right. When you think about hard faring naval cultures in fantasy stories, you click that open and the Cavanians, the Greyjoys, and the Fire Nation are all in that category. And so then you can then go deeper and they all will have their own particular subfolders, whatever, whatever. Right. They're certainly cut in cloth. Um, and so they don't, those folks don't see an to. And again, I try not to beat people over the head with all of this info dumping that yeah. I could. So basically, what the uh, and uh, shout out to Ed Ed uh, Ed Liley who is doing the artwork on this. I picked him because I read his comic, and his comic is like sixty pages of pure action. There's and I don't mean that as like a, a disc of the comic. It's it's such a fast ride the story that I saw. So I picked him, and basically the first panel is them landing a boat on this island. That you see the boots off the ground. Think like D Day. Yeah, um, Normandy. And they're, and they're going and they're storming this beach looking for someone um, and, and they find them uh, but it just so happens that that individual is not alone and, and they can handle themselves too so you get a nice little insight into what is actually going on outside of the field within this world right and there's not a lot of artists that can draw action sequences correctly mm -hmm. and I, I, you, you may have found like the right person for that I think I did, you know, in this, that's another thing that I'm doing as well. You know, I picked Luke Horsman, shout out to Luke, who is the main illustrator for this project because of his ability to world build with his art. Um, there's a scene in, I think it's on page 20 in the uh, 19 or 20, somewhere around there in the first issue where he shows, it's a full shot of King Julius at the head of his army his sons are right there and they're walking into this, uh, they're walking into this thicket of just like this wooded area. And the way, and, and, and we hint at in the scene prior that they're looking for a downed tree. So, you know, the right artist, a good artist is gonna put a broken tree branch and yeah, here we go. The right artist from a world building fantasy perspective is going to do what he did and put, you know, deep, mushrooms to indicate that this is a decomposing spot mm -hmm. because right. this tree you know didn't fall you know it, it's like little things like that like, yeah. so and you don't and i don't ask for that right but when i saw in him 
when I found his artwork was someone who was just going to approach art that way. Yep. Uh, and so that's why I chose him. And then the young lady that I'm working with uh, for the short that I just sent you. Apollonia, she, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, she's uh, out, of, out of New York. Uh, I actually wanted to work with her as the main illustrator a year ago, um, but we couldn't connect. So I ended up having to move on and find Luke, which I think at the end of the day was uh, serendipitous. It, it was a good choice. It was a good thing because what Apple really does well, in my opinion, is the way that she captures emotion in her characters and in her framing of story. It's mm -hmm. perfect for this kind of lore-based, emotional-based um, intermission, as I call it, in the story. And then I had, you know, uh, Martin who did the first short story and Edward who did the second short story, which are both action-based and they both hit that out of the park in my opinion. So I'm picking artists to come on board because so much of comic books is the art, but yes. also so much of fantasy is the world building. So much of fantasy is the tone and the mood. You know, mm -hmm. people who don't like fantasy or try hard not to understand fantasy, they think it's all about magic and swords. Um, yeah, that's there. But there's so that's not what defines a fantasy tale, um, and, and so um, there's that. That's why I made those artistic choices, and, and I'm happy with them for this first this first go on. Yeah, because generally in fantasy tales, you don't necessarily amongst families, you're not seeing uh, the personalities of somebody living in civilized modern civilized nations like we do here on Earth. You know, most of the time, the people how they go about their business might be a little barbaric. You know, they have a different way of settling things. Uh, it's, it, there, there's some, there's some established countries that are basically around here on earth right now. You know what I'm saying? Where if you do something wrong, something will happen to you. <laughs> yep. You know, yep. it's not, it's not that you're going to jail because they still hold the traits of what they did in the old times that if you steal something, you might lose a hand. Yep. You know, you're, the, the, the sentencing of their criminals might be done in a public forum, meaning out in the public, and you will be ridiculed for your actions. You know, you don't see that nowadays. That's kind of foreign to a lot of people. Which I think is what turns people off from the genre, honestly, because if you're, let's say you're not a history buff. Let's say you're not even remotely interested in history. Mm -hmm. You don't really have a lens to view that type of behavior. You know, you don't, and, and not to justify it or not, because that's a conversation that quickly becomes, you know, politically steeped and ethically and morally framed. And, but there's a reason why in certain parts of the world, if you steal something, you lose a hand. And mm -hmm. there's a reason why that makes sense for those cultures. A yeah, it only, only, gives you, only gives you two times to steal some good shit. <laughs> and then you're done. Boom. You know, what are you going to do? You know, and, and so it's one of those situations and they probably wouldn't even give you the second chance. They cut your hand off, they're probably cutting your head off and that's because, you know, if, if you didn't much. learn after I cut your hand off, <laughs> you're probably not going to get it. And, and, and again, to use that directly back into one of the major kind of touch points for fantasy and, and pop culture, when Jamie Lannister loses his hand, people who watch the television, this is one of the ways that I think, God, I, I, I try to avoid talking about Game of Thrones because it hurts. <laughs> there's i say that but only i don't really mean it i love i still love talking about it. but the the fact that the arguably the finest swordsman in the history of the realm mm -hmm. loses his sword hand yeah at a time where we as readers still don't understand that he's also arguably the most noble swordsman to have ever lived now yes he got a little fucked up in the head a few years ago yeah. And he happens to have a weird relationship with his sister, to put it lightly, but he's an extremely noble character. Spoilers, Game of Thrones, yeah. too he, long go away. He's yeah. the one that counteracts diplomacy amongst everybody, even when he is conquering them amongst being a Lannister. Yeah, I mean, and when you think about where he, he was, he was basically given everything, good enough to hold on to it. And then, you know, what, what people think, you know, he gets the, the Kingslayer tag, um, you know, he, he, argue, he, he, he definitely saved the realm. I mean, right. folks who watched Game of Thrones, you saw what Daenerys did because nobody cut her head off. Yeah. Well, her daddy would have done that a few years earlier if Jamie didn't kill her. Because right? he was a whole blown nut. <laughs> he he, so Danny wouldn't have had to worry about any of that, right? We wouldn't have had a story. So the fact that that guy loses his hand 
after he had, you know, gone through what he went through. And that is the, in the books, the center of him turning around the way that he lives his life, the TV show, they kind of make him start to turn around and send him right back to the person he used to be, which is a weird choice. But the point is like there, you know, there's a, there's a lesson there. You know, there's a lesson in, in, in losing a hand. There's a lesson in losing a foot that is a very real and harsh lesson in the real world. But in a, in a story, it carry, that can carry a lot of weight. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why fantasy authors like to lean into that stuff. Some of the grittier parts of what make us humans. But that's not everything that's in those stories. Now, the, the, the storyline of Anatu, the, upon the first issues read, and even continuing on in this in this phase with him being nomadic, I felt a lot of like spaghetti westerns that I used to watch with my grandfather as a kid, of that that one gunman just walking aimlessly through the desert, mm-hmm. then encountering a bunch of people and moving on, yep. because he had that objective in his head. Yep. Is that how I'm I'm supposed to see it? One hundred percent, and that is how. <clears throat> And, and that is how his story will be told, right? And that it also gives us a great opportunity to see a theater this way, right? And to see the world and to see politics, but not necessarily get lost in them with his character because he doesn't really have a dog in this fight. Mm-hmm. He's what is, you know- uh, Probably uh, why he keeps leaving. He, he when, something, when, when, when something goes on in this world, he has one, does, he, he runs it across one question, which is, can I find peace here? Can I start over here? Yes or no? And for him, any place that is going to force him or play to his violent tendencies isn't the right place because mm-hmm. he's, he's seen too much. He's done too much. And in the first issue, him getting that quick fight, we all know, you know, you, you can't beat somebody up at school and then expect them not to go tell their cousins and come see you on Friday, you know, when you're trying to walk home, right? Like then right. you you punch one dude in the face and now their their cousins from you know next town over are waiting for you. Right. And so like he has to go. And so you but there's something to that spaghetti western bit as well, because in those stories you have these kind of vigilante figures and not necessarily fi- always figures of the law. Some of them are, but typically they tend to be that person who sits just outside the law, but is noble. Um, and, and, and you could argue that that is exactly where I'm trying to place a not to in this culture. But the flip side of that is no one knows who he is. So he's not outside the law. He just, nobody really cares yet. So right. what you're seeing in arc one is, um, you know the if you could you know I, i'm a star wars guy as well so which is also a, a fantasy story that's Perfect. yeah it's coded in in space stuff but that's that's about wizards too folks um <laughs> yeah which is magic um and so you know you have you have the character of boba fett which the timing on my end in terms of putting the story out in the world coincides well with the mandalorian um because you look at the way that the mandalorian is being played from the perspective of the folks at Disney and Lucasfilm. They have this beautiful world and you, all you need is a spaceship that can make a hyper jump to get wherever you want. Yep. So who's the one character that's gonna bounce around faster than anybody else? Not necessarily a Jedi, a Jedi has duties. A Senator has a home planet in Coruscant. So a Sith Lord, yeah, maybe, but you know, Hayden Christensen probably a little you know, too old. I hope we get a Vader series, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, long story short, the Mandalorian was the perfect character for that. Right. Um, Natu in this world is the perfect character for us, although we don't have hyper jumps, to see a theater because he has nowhere to be. He has no ties to any of these places. So as soon as they become too hot for him, he leaves. <clears throat> and eventually he's going to make a name for himself um, the the act the, the end of arc one for not to um, is is so fun um, because you get the op- you know imagine playing a video game and uh, did you ever play any of the, uh, uh, the the Mordor video games and Lord of the Rings stuff did you ever play any of those I did not they, they're fun um, I'm blanking on the name what are they like RPGs yeah they're kind of like open world like Skyrim esque ah know? okay 
a little softer on the uh, you know, uh, role playing bit, like in leveling systems, but you have all that. Um, you, you know, almost like Assassin's Creed ish uh, is a good way to think about it. Um, that's another, I can use that example as well. You know, the way that Assassin's Creed, you move, you, you played that, right? Had played yep. that one. You go to a new city. Um, and this in the early games, I haven't played it in the moment, but like the first one, you go to a new place, you scope it out, you're doing your thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, after you get tired of jumping off of churches into hay bales or hay, you know, barrels of hay, um, you decide to go on this mission. And as soon as you do what you need to do in that mission, you can't hang out there anymore. Right. Like you, you were fine to explore, to do your thing. But the second people know your name, you got to go. Um, you basically get that moment for a not to at the end of this arc where right. he finally he, he's been trying to and he is trying to remain um, free from any obligation here. But he's just a particular type of person. So he right. runs into another person who is in need of a person. Uh, of his skills, right? And right. so, and, and that individual knows a little bit of history. They know how to tug at his heartstrings and they do that. Um, and, and ultimately you see um, the, the, the first event that's gonna lead to him kind of being infamous in this world uh, or in this new country. And that's kind of how his story ends. You know, he, he, he's not in any trouble per se, but you know, you know that he will be once people figure out who was involved. Dope. Now the 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 snippet that you just sent me, well, you sent me a couple of days ago. That was pretty much my introduction to magic in this world yeah. and spirituality. Yeah. Although of the same skin tone, I don't feel they are of the same people as a not to. Am I wrong? You are not wrong. No, you are correct. Yeah. They uh, and, and so you know I I have a kind of again, as a fantasy author, you know, fantasy races are important. So elves and orcs and things like that. And, and how I choose to use them, um, you know, and whether or not I choose to use them and put them into the main part of the story was a big, a big back and forth for me. Um, you know, the Lord of the Rings and that, those three stories are kind of centered around interspecies, interrace, um, from a fantasy race perspective, uh, battle. Right, and, and you have your elves and your orcs and your dark lords, and, and that's very much in the front of that story. And then you flip to, to let's let's skip George R. R. Martin, not to disrespect there, but we've been talking about that a lot. Mm -hmm. But my other new favorite is, is the Stormlight Archive, and you have on that end where you know as Brandon Sanderson is telling his story, you learn more about the magic and how much the players from a magical perspective are involved, mm -hmm. but you can miss it if you didn't read past the first book, because there really isn't much there. You know, there's talk of gods and you get some hints and but you don't really get to experience it. And so I'm kind of trying to take that route, right? Like there are these fantasy races in Amashu. There are different types of magic, but, and, and they matter and they matter to the people who they matter to, but they don't matter to everyone um, because magic isn't everywhere in this world. Mm. Um, magic is is cultural at this point think back to that pangea analogy there were certain cultures that had the skills necessary to perform you know certain things they had mad they had they had talents uh, mm -hmm. let's call it. you know imagine like a, you know if superheroes all lived in you know, arkansas or something i don't know and you knew if you went to arkansas you're gonna run some superheroes Right. But if you went to California, there weren't really many superheroes out in California. So you knew of them, but you never really interacted with them. You tried to pick two places that are very different, right? Um, and, and so, and, and you knew they were out there, but you didn't really care because it didn't have anything to do with you. That's kind of how magic existed in this world. And then post-separation, that just became even more entrenched. Um, mm -hmm. To give a, a little bit of a tease, you know, when I introduced the next third of the world, um, that's where most of the magic ended up post-separation. So gotcha. magic is very much a part of how the hierarchy there is set up. And just to give a, a little hint there and look there, you know, there's a, a it's known as the Kingdom of Edhel. And the Kingdom of Edhel is uh, broken up into magical factions. And, and though there, there's four different magic types. And you've seen one of those magic types in this culture that you're right. referring to. Right? So you've seen them. But they're almost like on the God level of this magic type. When you see that magic type again in the kingdom of Edhel, 
they can't do what Niali can do. They can't phase in and out like that. They can't, they, they can do certain things within that branch of the magic tree, but they're not on that level. Yeah, because it's also, there's a portion of it referred to as the in-between. Mm -hmm. so, so is this like yeah. dimension wise? Yes, exactly. And that's why the book, so you, it's hard, it doesn't hit like it will hit when you get the physical book, but I'm excited to go to Kickstarter with this one because there's, you, in the digital, you just read it in one direction in kind of English, and then it goes backwards in the original I language. I saw that because I did that like a couple times. I went up and down. So when you, when you, <laughs> when, when you get that book in your hands, you're going to have Niawi kind of running at herself at the end there, right? And, and, and you're in the you're in the in between in that story, and, and yes, that's in between dimensions. And so uh, you're getting her intermission story before issue three because she will visit, and this is a spoiler, but it doesn't mean anything in, in, in the real sense of the word. The place that she's visiting, um, not in spirit, right? Did you see Interstellar? Yes. So you know where how he you know is, he's the one who's throwing the books the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how she was visiting that world. And there's a little panel that I think Apple pulled off wonderfully that was all inspired by that scene where he's in the bookshelf in Interstellar. And it's where she's sitting in her meditation stance, but she's confused. And then she ends up falling in the real world because she got knocked out of that dimension by someone who was a little bit more powerful than she was, mm. uh, which is why she is at the end of that. She's like, whoa, 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 I got to go. Um, yeah. She recognizes something. You get the answer to what she recognized a little bit, but she actually visits that place in the real time uh, in issue three. And so the place that she was kind of watching and right. got pulled into, she goes there for real now. She was there in, she was there in spirit in a way. Yeah. Um, she can go there for real. So it's that's like an astral plane ridden parallel yeah. universe. Which is where where I, it exists on this side, but there's a mirror view on this side. And only certain folks can do that. Now, just because I've talked so much about that kind of tree of tree, branch of the magic tree, in, in modern times, there are two cultures that still have access to um, what we would call like just this really deep meditation. And they can um, astral, basically they can astral project, but they can only do it in their dimension. So, mm. uh, and, and so astral projection is a really easy way to describe kind of the watered down version of the magic that you're seeing there um and, and and so there's these watered down versions of these older more historical magic systems that still exist and most of them are on that kind of eastern third of the world so when we get our little tease at the end of the year with the high value target you get a tease of another one of those magic trees and the, the reason why that this group of people are chasing that individual with the magic has everything to do with that kingdom of Ed Hell and right. their, their issues. So that could be a whole book in and of itself because there's a basically a, somebody died, somebody's supposed to take over, somebody wants no part of the responsibility. And so we get our, our event in that short story. So when I say there's so many notes here that like, Stories that write themselves because I've lived in Amashi for far too long. <laughs> <laughs> they just write, they, they write themselves in a way. But it has allowed you to step outside of the box. Yep. And I say that to say this because not only any ad is what it is and you've built, you're still building an incredible storyline, but you've actually taken the time to join in with Wingless Comics as well. Yes. And the Nightfall series, you've created more more so of a short story mm -hmm. called the Saber Initiative. Yep. First of all, congratulations. I, I know Brian, I know Malachi and good people, great, great people. And and the storylines that they put together, I got Nightfall actually like right over here in Justice. Yep. And I'm, I'm waiting for Justice, too. And the way that they illustrate their world when when it was announced that basically you got brought on board, I was like, okay, this makes the most sense out of a lot of things. Appreciate it. You know, uh, so I reached out to Brian. Um, so yes, I, I have done so much early legwork with NEAD. Um, 
not the, I'm not bored by any means. Again, it doesn't I, seem like I, it. I got a four month old in the other room here, but mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I'm not bored. But as someone who's a writer and a creator who's now leaning into that, um, there's just stories and stories. So there there was a there was a time where, and I actually mentioned this to you early in our conversation. I was thinking about doing bookends of a story, right? Mm -hmm. Bookends of, of like this was the early end of the Ennead universe. And I'd eventually tell the story later on. But with that, I, do, I asked myself, well, what would happen if, um, and, and I don't, maybe I, I'm, I'm backing myself up because I haven't necessarily run any of this by Brian yet, but I'll leave it in, the, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it spoiler free for what happens there because the Saber Initiative actually takes place after the events of Nightfall. So we got that little tease. We won't see anything else for a little while. Um, but there was a, I asked myself, what would happen if my religion that I created, the worship of the divine, stayed around and just developed like you know, ancient religions have? Um, how would people in modern day feel about this religion? What would they follow? And what would they do? What would they be like? And so I wrote, a, I wrote basically a hymn, wrote a little prayer. Um, yeah. and, um, and, and from that prayer, I got this idea, well, if someone took this and, and took the most um, perverse reading of this prayer and tried to then create a cult following around it, what would that cult end up doing? Um, and so I ended up having this really interesting um, villain, antagonist in this, uh, and I had no one to put them up against. And so I was faced with, do I actually craft this? So somehow this fits in my world or is there somewhere else I can put this and so I, I too am a fan of wingless and had you know I've read justice one and I, I had read 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 nightfall and and I read nightfall and I was like holy shit yeah this could work here and so I I, I, I didn't immediately hit Brian up but I read nightfall a few more times and then I hit him up because I was like this can work and and if I if I pitch this to him right he's going to see that it can work too right and he agreed <laughs> and, and it is detailed from basically uh after of course after the events of nightfall so it's pretty much a a winged angel flying throughout the sky op characters galore powers being circulated but this is more so from the point of view of a is, is it a cop she's a detective yeah she's a detective on the ground and all this has happened. Like, how, how do you react to this? <laughs> so, you know, what? so there, the Saber Initiative, um, and again, they, uh, there's, there, there, there's a reason why the title is called that. Folks, go read Nightfall, and you can easily pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. Get to the middle of Nightfall and pay close attention. Um, and, and you'll see, you'll get your answer. Um, and so the folks who are in, you know, there, there's some very wealthy folks within this, the, the, the wing verse who, start this initiative and um clinton city which is where we're seeing in the saber initiative comic um has been a beneficiary of some of their philanthropy let's just put it that way mm -hmm. um so what we're seeing is a detective in this city um that is very important to those individuals and their motives now if you read nightfall you recognize right away that those individuals have their surface layer motives and yes. they have the deeper motives so mm -hmm. we're basically taking that story and pulling it not out of the rest of the justice and her and, and, and all of that. That still is in caliber and that's also the part of it. But we're basically saying, well, yeah, the superhero is over here, but these folks with all this money and all this initiative and all this know-how, they're not yep. only going to hang out here. They're going to be doing things elsewhere. So um, we're basically seeing the effects of kind of that that battle that justice is steeped in but what's going on elsewhere where justice can't be he can't be everywhere caliburn can't be everywhere her mm -hmm. can't be everywhere so what happens when the superheroes aren't there to watch and, and very much in the, in the sense of like the marvel shield type yeah. of deal like who, who else is there and so um we're, we're gonna we're gonna play around in that playground within the wing verse so it, it just gave me an opportunity to take <clears throat> what was a pretty well thought out, again, religious antagonist and, and, and this uh, very particular perverse view of a religious thought. And because justice has such 
Um, and it's not a religious book, but it pays so much attention to Christian mythology and Christian mythos. The divine is a is my own derivative of Christianity. So I was like, well, right. yeah, this is perfect. So let me just spin it back to where I got all my stuff from in the first place and mm-hmm. put it back in as a, a, a I don't want to say a mystery, but a particular read of Christian doctrine and it worked. And so once we uh, realized it worked, we got all the paperwork out of the way and jumped in. So issue one and two. Uh, uh, so issue zero, which you'll see on the back of Justice 2, um, and then issue one and two are already written and scripted. Issue one has kind of been edited and is ready to go once we hit the go button. Issue two, um, we're still working through the kinks. Um, I don't even know if I sent that to Brian. Brian, if you didn't know, it's, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> it's on its way. Four, four months old. Um, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm just, I, I want to, I, I want to continue to hone my craft um you know i, I want to continue to improve my ability to tell stories so the opportunity and the challenge to play by somebody else's rules um has been uh, a great opportunity for me dope man yo look in in the past year that i've gotten to know you you've been on a tear <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So from issue one, issue two, now sending me the 10 pages of issue three, Saber Initiative, you already talked about how issue zero, issue zero, I know I'm going to get my hands pretty soon. Issue one is issue two, uh, already written and <laughs> sent up the river. Brother, keep writing. That's all I got to say. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to read anything that you're putting out. You've uh, obviously uh, from from your from your love of graphic novels, comics, fantasy and the derivatives in which you explain it have made it worthwhile for you for for this to be the career path going forward appreciate that and man. no yeah. absolutely absolutely there's so much man and, and there's one reason why i love talking to you because you you can go where i'm going right there's so many things and i said i want to plant a flag and i haven't mentioned this in the beginning i wasn't sure if i was going to mention this about king Ulysses and where his name came from so yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Dan Carlin and Hardcore History. I think we've talked about him before yeah. a little bit. Um, and he has a, uh, one of his mini series is, uh, he, has, he has a couple on ancient Rome, but he has one, it's called the Celtic Holocaust. And they follow Julius Caesar. Um, yeah, the name speaks for itself, right? Yep. As he does some things, commits some atrocities, right? But we know Caesar as a, as a hero, right? So one, there were a few things that clicked right before I told this story. And one of them was me listening to this podcast series. I think it's just one long episode, might be three to six hour range. Dan Carlin can talk forever, um, as can I. But um, the, basically, he, in this episode, he talks about the fact that, well, actually, you can make a case that we're pronouncing Julius Caesar wrong. You uh-huh. could actually case phonetically that his name is pronounced Julius Caesar. So that's my kin's name, Julius right. Caesar. Um, and that, again, anybody who knows anything about history, anything about ancient Rome, anything about Julius Caesar, you don't just take his name or the derivative of his name for no reason. Right? Right. So not to foreshadow where his story may or may not go, but if you know the person, and, mm-hmm. and again, that, that Celtic Holocaust episode is all about the fact that Caesar basically, while he was on this very long campaign, the campaign that really made him who Rome knew him as to allow him to do what he did, basically stomp out the Republic for you know all in for all it was, I and mean, kind of put the nat- last nail in that coffin. He built that aura on that campaign that they talk about, and basically he 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 did the fighting, he wrote the book. He, sp- he spread the propaganda. He did everything he needed to do. So when he spun back towards Rome and, you know, crossed the Rubicon, right? Uh, yeah. He, he, he did it with this larger than life personality. And Carlin explores in this episode, you know, we're, how much of this is true? Like, he's telling us all this. Yeah. We don't necessarily know. We know he was doing some things and, and we know he was out there, but he also is, in, he, he could be embellishing. And it's not even, that's not even what the episode's about, but he makes that hint and that's what caught my attention. And that was where this right. camp name came from. Man, now see, that makes it even more compelling and makes it, puts it, puts it in a more perspective that 
as to why King Julius is out on the front line so much. Yeah. Because he feel like he feels as though, OK, if the story is going to be told, the story is going to be told with me in it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to plagiarize anything here. The way that I craft this is going to be of my own doing. Yep. And when you think about the the power structure within the Ennead and, and the way it falls, you know, there were those three generations. He's married to the third generation mama, Queen Ilaria. She's uh -huh. the one with the power. He's married to her. His sons have no right to the throne because after the third generation, they all have to abdicate power once his wife dies. That's the way, that's what the rule of nine says. Um, so, and also I didn't name the story that for no reason, right? That is the ultimate conflict. Right. We're on the cusp of the rule of nine being put to the test for the first time. Because when the country began, you know, yeah, all right, we got this rule of nine, great, three generations, awesome. Well, now here we are. The third generation monarch, the one with the power has to step down. Now. Are they going to do it? Is this family going to do it? Um, and, and so that's that's where we have. We were, we're, and I'm pulling from all over the place. So again, I appreciate you, you saying that. And, and I definitely will continue writing. Uh, I was working on the next arc earlier today. So I'm, 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 I'm working, man. And I, I'm, I'm excited to continue to bring it to you um, and have these conversations. Word, man. And, and it's always good talking to you. And I appreciate you doing this with me. Um, I can only feel as though viewers will benefit from the work that you put in because you do the work, you do the homework on it. As far as like keeping everything to detail, you're, you tend to be a visionary in the aspect of the things that you've read in the past and how that formulates how you craft your writing, which is beyond dope. Appreciate that, man. Really do. Or, or, and thank you again. Thank you. Absolutely. So Facts Project, we are out.